Hello, everyone, and happy Monday. Thank you for joining me today for our Wisconsin Kingdom Builders Praying for America. Uh, it's December 14th. It's the day that our uh, electorates vote for our president. It's a day that could very possibly uh, cause a lot of emotion if you are watching the news or listening to mainstream media propaganda. It's a day that even Christians with solid faith might feel their faith shaken because uh, many, many people on the other side and people who are uninformed about the legal issues going on in our uh, election right now are going to declare a victory for Biden. I want to just tell you right out of the gates that the electoral votes will not be counted until January 4th. They go into a sealed envelope today. Um, I want to say that we are not inaugurating a president today. We're inaugurating a president, I believe, on January 21st. So what we do between now and January 20th is of the utmost importance. Um, I'm going to start by sharing with you a dream that Tim Sheets, Dutch Sheets' brother, had yesterday. And he admittedly is not uh, one to get prophetic dreams, but he is a hunter. And in this dream, he was looking at the hunting schedule, small and large game. And um, anyone who, who hunts knows what this is. It tells you the dates for open season and how many tags um, you are able to have or how many of those animals you're able to tag as your own and hunt. And so he's reading, um, starting with small game like squirrels and rabbits and working up to deer and the dates for each and the amount of tags. And he notices in the dream at the bottom of this list, it says, um, you know, deer on these dates and whatnot. And then it says giants, giants, December 14th to January 20th, no limit on tags, giant season. December 14th to January 20th and no limit on tags. This is awesome. So that made me think about the giants um, in the Old Testament and the giant Goliath that David went up against. And so I went and read in 1 Samuel 17. And I want to read that to you today because um, we need to understand David's mindset in this story because we are David in this story. The church is the David in this story. We've been anointed. We've been given kingly authority. We've been given the Holy Spirit, but we're kind of like David in that we're inexperienced going up against giants. Most of us um, have maybe had to fight some giants in our own life, but we certainly have not come up against giants in, at a national level or even a global level. And so many of us are like David. We're young boys that have been doing what you know our father told us. We're shepherding sheep out in the fields, and we're not realizing my friends, how what we're doing in our personal lives while we're out tending the sheep, so to speak, how we're being prepared for fighting giants until the moment comes where we're facing the giant. And that's when we realize that we've been being prepared for this moment. And that's exactly what happens with David. So I'm going to read to you from 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse um, let me see here. This is from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, verse 3, and it's kind of lengthy, but stick with me. It's an awesome story. The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. So I want you to picture the Philistines are the spiritual enemies we're fighting, and the, the Israel in this story is the church, the praying church. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall, and he wore a bronze helmet and a bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze sword that was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam and the iron point of his spear, the point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking out in front of him. Why does God take a minute to paint this picture of Goliath and tell us that just the point of his spear and the um, armor that he wore 
was the weight of a, of a short man. <laughs> he was carrying our wearing armor that weighed, you know, the weight of a man or a woman, uh, basically carrying a, another human being on his body effortlessly. Why would God take, take a minute to paint that picture? Because he wants us to understand that when this man walked out, he was very intimidating. The sight of him was very daunting. I want you to understand that all the times that you've heard the news and you've received reports of what's going on in our country is just like this moment for Israel. It can be very daunting. It can be very intimidating. The giant looks big. The giant looks like he's going to win. And the giant certainly looks effortless. He looks like a formidable foe. And then he opens his mouth and he's extremely arrogant. I mean, he's beyond confident, which we're going to find out in a moment. So I want you to see that this Goliath is exactly a picture of the enemies that we face today. He stood and he shouted to the Israelite battle formations. Why do you come out to line up in battle formation? He asked them. Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? So choose one of your men and have him come down against me. So he's in his pride and arrogance. He's calling out for just one man to come and fight him, okay? And he's saying, why don't you just pick a guy? If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win and kill him, you will be our servants. And, um, and so the Philistine says, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Here comes that arrogance. Arrogance, send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words, they lost their courage and they were terrified. Okay, guys, we can't let that be us. We cannot let that be us. The praying church, the church that has been hearing the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the church that's rooted and grounded in the rock, Jesus Christ, cannot be terrified and lose courage at the taunting of the enemy. And we're, we're going to be hearing a lot of taunting. We're going to be hearing a lot of stuff in the coming days between now and January 4th when those votes are counted. We're going to be hearing things even beyond that when votes are counted and when there is action taken in our Senate. By the way, Vice President Mike Pence is the head of the Senate. He will be the one ruling over the counting of the electoral votes on January 4th. VP Mike Pence has authority in that session that no one else has. If that doesn't give you hope, well, then you probably don't have a pulse. So let's, let's stay alive and let's stay full of hope. And let's read on here with Goliath and this beautiful metaphor for what we're dealing with today. Now, David was the son of uh, Jesse. Jesse had eight sons and during Saul's reign uh, was already an old man. So Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war and their names were uh, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah was the third. David was the youngest son. So the three eldest sons had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth to Saul, to and from Saul, to tend his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. Okay, so I want you to see this picture. Every morning and every evening, the Philistine giant was coming out to taunt the Israelites. The, the fear, the intimidation, the propaganda kept on coming. Does that sound familiar? Every morning or one day, Jesse told his son David, take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp for your brothers. Um, Yes, and hurry to their camp. Also take these 10 portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the welfare of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Ilia fighting with the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up and set out as Jesse had instructed him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines had lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and he ran to the battle line. 
When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and he shouted his usual words, which this time David heard. Okay, I want you to know that all of Israel had been hearing this, but now David hears it for the first time. And um, when all of Israel saw Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. So now not only does David hear the words of Goliath, he sees his brothers, his fellow Israelites, retreating in terror. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the household of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. So the king of Israel is offering riches, his daughter, and tax, uh, freedom from all tax to any man who comes and fights Goliath. The king himself won't even go up against this guy. This is sad, you guys. This is sad. And this reminds me of the American church. David speaks to the men who are standing with him and says, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So you see there's only one man in all of Israel who is rightfully outraged at what's happening. There's one man, and he's like 16. Some, some people think maybe even 15 years old. He's not even a man in our terms. He was in their terms because they had their ceremony from boyhood to manhood at like 13. But he's literally a teenager, and he's the only one who understands that this is outrageous and unacceptable. The people told David about the offer, concluding that is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother, uh, Eliab, listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. So now his big brother, is he's, he's outraged at his little brother, and he says, why'd you come down here? Who did you leave your few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down here to see the battle. His brother, his pride is wounded. He's like, David, you just came down here to watch us be made fools of. And no big brother wants his little brother to come and rub his face in defeat, right? And David says to his brother, what have I done now? It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to the others in front of him, and he asked about this offer. The people gave him the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported back to Saul. So he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he, meaning Goliath, has been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. I want to just stop there for a minute. David keeps having to be the one to point out to the entire army and the king, the general of the army, that this Philistine is defying God. David is the one saying, you guys, you're missing the spiritual perspective. This isn't about a giant and an army that's afraid. This is about someone defying the living God. This is, this is a spiritual battle. You're looking at it in the natural. This is why this is such a metaphor for us today, because most people are only looking at this entire battle from a natural perspective. They're saying, look at what's going on in the natural. Look at the votes. Look at the maps that are being shown on CNN. Look at the electorates. Look at this battleground states that are losing their fight. Look at Wisconsin is now certified. And they're looking at this in the natural. And David is echoing today, saying, who is this that's defying the living God? 
there is a real enemy that is defying the purposes and plans of the living God in this world today. And that's what this fight is really about. And David, that's why he represents the praying church, the remnant church, because the praying church is the only church that's staying focused on the spiritual battle and saying no one and nothing will defy the living God. And so David goes on to say, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on him. He had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over all these military clothes and he tried to walk, but he couldn't even walk. He said, I can't walk in these. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. What does that symbolize? This is what happens when the church tries to put on the clothes that the world gives us, the protection that the world offers. And we can't even walk in that kind of protection. We're not called to walk by the ways of this world. We're called to walk spiritually by faith and not by sight. And that's why David could not wear Saul's armor. It was a natural armor. And David was going into a spiritual battle. And so David instead took his staff, and then he chose five smooth stones and he put them in his pouch in his shepherd's bag. He, he used the armor, the spiritual weapons that God had given him out in the wilderness as he tended the sheep. It wasn't the army, um, the, the weapons of the army that David needed. It was the weapons that God him, had already taught him how to use in the wilderness. This is so important for us, you guys, because every one of us has spent time in the wilderness. I'm thinking of some of you in this group right now, some of the warriors that are praying with me, and God has given you stones and a slingshot and taught you how to aim the stones. The stones represent pieces of the rock. What's the rock? Jesus. What is Jesus? He's the word. Stones represent scripture and truths that God has given you to aim at the lies of the enemy and launch them square between his eyes. And this is what God is telling David, use the weapons I've already taught you how to use while you were out there defending my sheep from the lions and the bears. And each one of you has stones in your shepherd's pouch that the Lord has taught you how to use. You know how to defeat the lies of the enemy and the spiritual giants from your own walk with the Lord. And this is what David does. And he goes out with his shepherd's bag, a sling in his hand, and a staff. The staff represents authority. The staff represents authority. David had the authority given to him when Samuel anointed him. You have authority given to you when you were chosen and anointed with God's Holy Spirit when Jesus came to live on the inside of you. And David goes up against a giant with these simple things, simple yet powerful. And this is the point at which I want to remind you that the enemy in this story, just like our enemy, has power. There's real power. This giant is huge. He is a formidable foe. He is powerful. He is confident. But what he does not have is authority. David takes the staff of authority with him. We, the church, have authority to bring heaven's will on the earth in our own lives, in our families' lives, in our state, in our community, in our nation. We all have the staff of authority. Are you using the staff of authority or are you standing there saying, what am I to do? I am helpless pick up the staff of authority that's been given to you and the five smooth stones. By the way, the, the number five is symbolic. It represents grace. The grace of God is on your side. The number five represents the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. And guess what? We, the bride of Christ, have been chosen. The five smooth stones is the bride to defeat the Goliath in this land. 
we have not no business getting discouraged. We have way too many promises. We are the five smooth stones. We're loaded with more five smooth stones and we carry the staff of authority. We were chosen and anointed just like David for such a time as this. So imagine Goliath when up walks a teenager with no armor, no sword, a staff, a slingshot, and a shepherd's bag. This not only um, uh, taunted Goliath, but it enraged him. It was an insult to him. This is what we're seeing in the state of affairs in the United States. Everything that those standing for righteousness are doing and saying is taunting the giants. The giants are enraged. And the giants like Haman in the book of Esther are building a gallows with which to hang us on. The giants are getting ready to overplay their hand, my friends. And this is exactly what Goliath does. So he says um, to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? He looked at the staff of the shepherd as nothing but a stick. He did not recognize the staff gave David authority, nor do our enemies recognize the authority that we have. They're so blinded by their arrogance. They're so blinded by their evil, so blinded by their um, plans and schemes. And their, the taste of victory is so near that they don't see that what we bring to the battle is authority, not a stick. Our enemy is like, who am I, a dog that you'd try to come and beat me with a stick? This is exactly where we want our enemy because that arrogance is their downfall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This puts us in a great position, my friends. I don't know why people are freaking out. We have nothing to freak out about. The enemy is playing right into our hands. So the Philistine then says to David, he says, uh, it says here, he cursed David by his gods. And then he says, come here and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the wild beasts. Do you see that arrogance? David says to the Philistine, you come against me. Now this is the church speaking. Listen up. You come against me with dagger, spear, and sword. But I come against you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel's armies, and you have defied him. And so David makes this about what it's actually about, an enemy of the Lord. This is not about political parties. This is not about President Trump per se or um, Vice President Biden who wants so desperately to be president. This is about an evil scheme against the Lord of hosts. We happen to be right in the middle of it. We happen to be God's secret weapon. We happen to be the David that is called to defeat the Goliath. But this is about someone, something in the dark realm coming against the Lord of Israel. And so David says this, listen to what faith sounds like if you've wondered. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I'll strike you down, cut off your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the creatures of the earth. Listen to the best part. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword and not by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. This needs to be our mantra during giant killing season. We need to be declaring that the whole world will know that there is a God and he is alive and well, that he's the God of Israel and the God of America. Why? Because America was destined to align with Israel to bring heaven to earth in this day. And we will be evidence that the Lord God Jehovah is alive and kicking. So when the Philistines started forward to attack David, David, listen, what did David do? Did he hesitate? Did he walk? No, it says David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. Church, this is us. We run quickly to defeat our giant. We don't hesitate. We don't fear. We run to battle because we have confidence that this is the Lord's fight and he will give us the victory.
David puts his hand in the bag, takes out a stone, slings it, and he hits the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell in his face to the ground. Listen, right behind your forehead, there is no muscle. It's skin on top of bone. The only way that stone sinks into his forehead is if the stone actually breaks the skull of the giant. David's stone broke the skull of the giant and this giant falls to the ground. David defeats the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Even though David had no sword, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. This one stone killed the giant. It was a mortal wound. David ran and stood over him, grabbed the Philistine's sword, pulled it from its sheath, and he used it to cut off the head of the Philistine. When the Philistine saw that their hero was dead, they ran. The man of Israel and Judah rallied, or the men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the road. You guys, this is our promise. This is our promise. David took Goliath's head, brought it back to Jerusalem, and he brought Goliath's weapons in his own tent. This is what we have to look forward to during giant hunting season. I adjure you, I, I admonish you, I beg you to pray with this kind of confidence, not in ourselves, not in our sling, and not even in our stone, but in the Lord, because this battle belongs to him. And the Bible says that whenever Israel went up against giants, they defeated them when they were obey, obeying the uh, instructions of the Lord. And so as we go forward in these days, praying between December 14th and January 20th, remember it's giant uh, hunting season. And that when we remember the battle belongs to the Lord, we take every single giant. So let's pray. Let's pray for the giants in our land. And let's pray for the giants in our own lives. And let's take this land. So Father, I thank you that the giants are yours for the taking. That this battle belongs to you. That the enemies of this nation and of this world seek to kill, steal, and destroy. And it is you that they are uh, coming up against. It's you that they defy. They are defying the word of the Lord. They're defying the judgments of the Lord, and they are defying the authority of the Lord. And so now in Jesus' name, we bring the word of God against these giants, and we declare them slain. We declare the giants' bodies to fall in the name of Jesus between now and January 20th. We declare your purposes, your right to rule over this land. We declare your promises. You made covenant with our fathers over this land, and we remind both the giants ourselves and heaven of these covenants that you have made with our founding fathers. We declare that this David will arise and defeat the giants in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, in the authority Jesus has given us. We thank you for every legal right that we have to defeat these giants, and we close every door to every enemy of America and of the world. We thank you, Father, that your purposes and plans for this nation will prevail. We thank you that these battleground states will be won. We thank you that the corruption will be exposed. We thank you that your judgment will fall, that the wheat will be separated from the chaff, that righteousness will shine forth like the dawn and the darkness will flee at the sight of it. I thank you, Father, for having your way in America. I thank you for having your way in all seven mountains of influence, government, media, arts and entertainment, business, the church, family, and um, what am I missing, Lord? I'm missing one. I thank you that all seven mountains of influence will honor you, serve you, that people are being placed there now. People who've been placed there are rising up and shining forth and being used. I thank you for uh, taking an ax to the root of the demonic plot 
to turn this nation into a godless socialist nation. I declare that your schemes will not prevail, Satan, but the word of the Lord will go forth and will be enacted. I thank you that angels hearken to the promises over America. I thank you for the state of Wisconsin, that it will arise and shine like the morning dawn, for the glory of the Lord is upon Wisconsin even now, that you're raising up men and women that are going to be out in front, um, trailblazers and pioneers in the move that's happening in America. Wisconsin is a key player. I thank you for raising up men and women in our state to lead the charge for righteousness. I thank you, Father, for overturning Roe v. Wade. I thank you for making us a nation once again that honors the Lord. I thank you for the greatest revival on the earth coming from America and spreading to the rest of the world, the third great awakening. And I thank you, Father, for saving the places in this country that even people have said are lost and not even worth praying for anymore. I pray for New York. I pray for California. I pray for the whole East Coast and the whole West Coast. Lord, places that even Christians despair to pray over anymore because of how dark they've become. I thank you for the heartland of America, uh, Lord, to become God-honoring, not compromising in our faith, that we would not be like Israel in the story of David and Goliath, where we shrink back, where we're terrified, where we're waiting for someone else to rise up and fight the giants, but that we would all become like David and boldly take down the giants in the coming days in Jesus' name. I thank you for every election result in every part of this nation being the, the light shining on it and it being a godly um, election result for integrity to be restored to our electoral process, for confidence to be restored to Americans in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for restoring churches, restoring your spirit, Lord, for the churches that are not welcoming your spirit to close. I pray for the churches that are in compromise, Lord, and won't repent to close in Jesus' name, and that you'd raise up a holy remnant among your people like never before. I thank you for the children of this nation, for the generations to come, that they would love and serve you, that we would tell our children and our children would tell their children and that we would be a God-honoring people. I thank you for peace where there's been chaos. I thank you that you make our enemies to be at peace with us. That's how unity will come, that you will even make our enemies to be at peace with us in Jesus' name. I thank you for all these things, and I remind you, Father, that you promised your son the nations. The nations are his inheritance, and so for your son's sake, I pray all these things. Amen. Thank you guys for praying with me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for commenting. Um, I so appreciate those watching online. Thank you for praying along with me. I love your faith. More than anything, we need to have the faith of David, uncompromising and immovable. David went forward running into battle. May that be us in the next uh, many days between now and January 20th. God bless you, and thanks for being with me and praying. Keep it up.